Okay, good evening, everybody. We're going to uh, share this, see what we have here. We're going to talk tonight about the Bath Ruth Nismal. What's up, Dante? Now, the Vathuth Small follows the Havamal and the Codex Regius. That's where everything originates, the Codex Regius. From stanza 20 on, it is also included in the Argamemnion Codex, the first part evidently having appeared on a leaf now lost. Schnorri quotes eight stanzas of it in the Prosetta, and in his prose text, closely paraphrases many others. Now, some people have a lot of issue with Schnorri, but we also need to remember that Schnorri was the presiding judge of the all thing at the time of this. Uh, compilation. The poem is wholly in dialogue form except for a single narrative stanza. After a brief introductory discussion between Odin and his wife Rig concerning the reputed wisdom of the giant Vafruthnir, Odin's always in quest of wisdom seeks out the giant calling himself Gangenroth. Now, when we look at it in those kinds of simple ideas, it becomes just a story. But we have to ask ourselves, do you remember what the number one New York Times bestseller was 10 years ago? Because I don't. And here we have this story, this great mythology that has lasted from, it says later on, from the middle of the 10th century. So a thousand years, this story has been kicking around. There is something within this tale that resonates at a level that is uh, essential for us to understand keeps coming back up like a uh, like a bad seed, a bad apple, something. So we can't remember what the number one New York Times bestseller was 10 years ago. We could probably Google it, but we have this poem that still kind of lingers around at the edges of our memory, at the edges of our education, at the edges of our understanding. If we look at it always as, oh, then going to seek wisdom against Gangrath, it really doesn't answer for me the question of why this poem is still here with us. The giant, and there's, so I have some ideas about what this might really consist of. The giant immediately insists that they shall demonstrate which is the wiser of the two and propounds four questions, stanzas 11, 13, 15, and 17, each of which Odin answers. It is then the gods turn to ask, and he begins with a series of 12 numbered questions regarding the origins and past history of life. So right off the bat, we get this idea that this giant, well, he needs to know that he's smarter than this guest. He's gonna to try to stand up and say, well, I'm just a little bit better than you because I understand. It's not an uncommon uh, happen, happening on social media today where we have great wordy dialogues with an attempt to determine that the quality of my heathenry might be somewhat better than yours because, well, I know just a little bit more than you. And nothing could be further from the truth. Um, all it means is that you have read some other books. Um, Socrates points out quite clearly in his discussion with Phaedrus that this reading of words does not in and of itself constitute an understanding of the wisdom contained therein. That comes from a mentor. That comes from the memorization and the instruction of mentor to student. And yet whatever is written in this particular tale is sufficiently powerful enough to have withstood the test of time of a thousand years. Some will say, like I said, some will have question or issue with story. I think story sold us out, but I think he also gave us apt warning for those that might understand uh, where the Christianization of this lore really does occur. It occurs with the demonization of hell. But I digress. Then, Faf, then Vafruthner answers and Odin asks five more questions this time referring to what is to follow the destruction of the gods, and the last one asking the name of his own slayer. Again, Valfruth near answer, and Odin finally propounds the unanswerable question. What spake Odin himself in the ears of his son, ere in the bale fire he burned? Valfruth near recognizing his questioner as Odin himself, admits his inferiority and wisdom, and so the contest ends. The whole poem is essentially encyclopedic in character and thus was particularly useful to Snorri in his preparation of the prose edda. <laughs> the encyclopedic poem with a slight narrative outline seems to have been exceedingly popular. The Grimness Small and much later Alva Small represent different phases of the same type. The Vafruthness Small and Grimness Small together indeed 
constitute a fairly complete dictionary of Norse mythology. And there has been much discussion as to the probable date of the Vafruthnis model, but it appears to belong to about the same time period as the Voluspe, in other words, the middle of the 10th century. While there may be a few interpolated passages in the poem as we now have it, it is clearly a united whole and evidently in relatively good condition. So that right there tells me that I've got something pretty important here. Now, as the mistake is generally made with regards to the uh, Vedas, um, the fact that it was compiled in the 10th century does not mean it originated in the 10th century. It most likely comes from a much older, it comes from a much older oral tradition passed down from presiding judge to presiding judge, if you will, uh, in household to household, to pass the long winter nights uh, to create an understanding of the world in which people might live in. The first thing we have is Odin spake counsel me, Frigg, for I long to fare, and Vathruth near fain would find. Fit wisdom old with the giant wise, myself what I seek to match. So the first thing he does, it's interesting, is he asks this divine feminine aspect of his life what she thinks about it. He doesn't just haul off and jump out there at this challenge. He doesn't lead with the chin. He seeks wise counsel because we've got to understand Frigg knows everything that he knows. She simply doesn't say it. She has that same level of understanding and comprehension that Odin has. He says so in the Eager's Feast. Frigg's response is typical. It's, it's a wise counsel. Here, Father, here at home would I keep, where the gods dwell together. Amid all the giants in equal of might to Vafir, none I know no, I none. So she tells him, this is going to be a staunch opponent. This is not something you should take lightly. Um, it would probably be best if you stay at home. And I think sometimes we need to consider that same counsel before we engage in the fray on social media. Um, when someone like myself puts up a very controversial post to find the weaknesses within the community that would spread it apart. Getting in an argument online has much the same effect. It serves no purpose. But Frick, Odin asks her, Frigg tells him, hey, you probably ought to keep your butt in the house instead of going out there looking for trouble. In the larger part of heathenry, and indeed some of the political ideas, we have people that do what I like to call leading with the chin. Odin kind of talks about it here. Much have I fared, much have I found, much have I got from the gods. Those individuals that routinely come online to develop their spirituality by reading, see, watch, looking at the memes or reading some interesting article. And that is the limit of their development. Um, I think it's one in 10 people last year that actually read a book. But there is an interesting dynamic occurring in Audible because people will listen to a story and they're listening to stories at a rate that is uh, amazing even to me people will listen to an audio book before they'll read a book because that is part of who we are. That is how information was transmitted from mentor to student for thousands of years before we decided it would be a smart thing to write it down. When we come across the people online whose limit of development or understanding of their spirituality originates online, they will feel that much they have fared, much they have found, and much they have got from the gods. But there's no wisdom in some of this understanding, and they will run off leading with the chin, talking about this conspiracy or that conspiracy. They're trying to keep us down, or, you know, I understand it's the people, we're losing Western civilization, so on and so forth, and they're going to front load everything they say with some kind of antagonistic message that so thoroughly defeats the purpose of anything successful they might be trying to put out, they lose their head so to speak. Amid all the giants, let's see, and fain would I know how Vafufner now lives in his lofty hall. And that's the question we need to be asking about these people. When they jump online with their insights concerning what they've learned online, how are they living? Are these nine noble virtues, are these ideas propounded and, and professed within, the, within this lore? Are they allowing them are they giving them permission to lead successful lives? What would that look like? They want to talk about having a traditional life as they drive to the grocery store with shelves that are literally groaning with food 
to buy a can of SpaghettiOs to pop in the microwave to feed their kid while they watch TV so they can go look at internet and talk about being traditional. Um, there's a disconnect somewhere in there that's not making sense. So we have to ask ourselves, how are these people living? What does their life look like? Do they enjoy success? Do they have some kind of peace? Do they understand what's important in this world and what's not? That's one of the reasons when we have these great big get togethers, we get to see each other, look each other in the eye, shake each other's hand, give each other a hug and get to know that person in real life and understand that there are failings. But success isn't a goal, it's a path. I'll do something better tomorrow than I did today. That's gonna work. You do that several days in a row, you're on to something good. Frigg spake, safe mouse thou go, safe come again, and safe be the way thou wendest. She wishes you well. Father of men, let thy mind be keen when speech with the giant thou seekest. She may not like it. She may have reservations about it. But this partner of his offers him 100% support. This partner offers him 100% support in his endeavor. She may not understand it. It's not always the feminine's role to understand what the masculine undertakes, but she wishes him the best. She sends him on his way with these great blessings. Safe best thou go, safe come again. Safe be the way thou wendest. And let thy mind be keen. The wisdom then of the giant wise forth did he fare to try. He found the hall of the father in him and in forthwith with Yig. See the uh, Bathruth near means the mighty in riddles. Nothing is known of the giant beyond what's told in the tale. Here father means the father of the host. Uh, Ig is a name for Odin. It means the terrible. Odin spake, Bathruth near hail to thy hall am I come for myself I fain would see if first and first would I ask if wise thou art or giant all wisdom hast won. Right off the bat, he goes in there and leads with the chin. He thinks he knows it all. And I see it happen all the time. And it's something we need to be aware of. Um, he asked him that question. Who do you think you are? How smart do you think you are? Well, sometimes when somebody comes around asking those kinds of questions, we might want to pay attention to who says, oh, how so? To Bathruth, near honoring hospitality, says, who is the man that speaks to me here in my lofty hall? Forth from our dwelling, thou shalt never fare unless wise, wiser than I thou art. So now it's a competition. And any time you poke a man's ego or threaten the idea of what he perceives himself as, which is what the ego is, our perception of who we are, anytime you put that in danger, you're threatening not the man in any real way, but you're threatening the carefully crafted image the man may have developed of himself. Now all of a sudden that's at risk. And if you shatter that image, what will they become? This is largely a hindrance to much personal growth. What happens to me if I let go of that anger or that resentment or that idea that I have held on to for so long that makes me feel like I am more important than the next fellow? Well, then strolled into that mighty hall and said, you ain't as smart as you think you are. And presented a very real threat to this carefully crafted image of this giant who is mighty and riddles. Oh, then spake, Yangenrath they call me, and thirsty I come from a journey hard to thy hall. Welcome I look for, long have I fared, and gentle greeting, giant. So here we go. We're, at, we're going to call on the rules of hospitality. So Vathruth near spake, why standest there thou on the floor whilst thou speak? A seat shalt thou have in my hall. So there are obligations of the guest. There are obligations of the host. You don't get to just show up and be an ass. So he, he backs up a little bit and says, you know what? Let me be a good guest. And Vathruth near decides, I'll be a good host, but the deal is still on. Then soon shall we know whose knowledge is more, the guests or the sages gray. Gangrenrath means the gain counselor. Odin on his travel always assumes a name other than his own. Odin spake, if a poor man reaches the home of the rich, let him wisely speak or be still. For to him who speaks with the heart of heart will chattering ever work ill. So that's pretty cool. If you show up at somebody's house, carry on a good conversation. 
talk about grand ideas, talk about dreams, talk about those hopes, talk about those achievements of science and technology, talk about those abilities of us to move forward as people. Um, me sitting around and start talking about somebody else that we dislike or ragging on the Kardashians or bitching about somebody else, um, that's never going to move you very forward. Someone will always immediately develop an idea of who you are right off the bat. That's the first chance you have to make an impression on anyone. Talk of some high-minded concept that is close to your heart. Speak with presence. Be in that moment. If you're going to talk to someone, don't be thinking about crafting the response to whatever they're going to say. Be in that moment. Listen. Be fully aware. Make your statement and pay attention. That is one of the most disarming and successful manners with which to develop that relationship with an individual so you might enjoy success together. Now, if you have another idea in mind, um, just punch them in the nose. It works. It just gets it out of the way. It's a whole lot easier. Speak now, gang and wrath. If they're from the floor, thou wouldst thy wisdom make known. What name has the steed that each morning knew the day for mankind doth draw? So we ask him, who pulls Suna's chariot? Odin spake skin faxy is he the steed for whom men the glittering day doth draw the best of horses to heroes he seems and brightly his mane doth burn. So Bafuth near spake. So right now we have an image of the sun, that thing, that great powerful source of energy for the entire solar system that powers every living thing on this planet. What's the horse? What's the power that moves that forward? He is the best steed, the best of horses to heroes he seems. I think travels faster than a beam of light. So they say 186,000 miles a second or something. This is the benefit to all mankind. Everything that's composed of water that is alive needs that sun. Bafuth near spake, speak forth now, gang and wrath. If they're from the floor, thou wouldst thy wisdom make known. What name has the steed that from the east anew brings night for the noble gods? Skin faxi, by the way, means shining mane. Oh, then spake, him faxi name they, that steed that anew brings night for the noble gods. Each morning foam from his bit there falls, and thence come the dew and the dales. That benefit, that changing of the day. The night marks the end of the day, and the sun marks the beginning of the day. They measured it in moons. And there's a lot to this measurement of time. If you look at the ancient megalithic structures throughout the, the megalithic period of the world, they are aligned to the stars, the sun and the moon. They charted the course of the day. Their astronomical observatories literally all over the world are so precise as to be astounding. Um, this measurement of time, this movement of the sun across the sky, the moon across the sky had a pattern. And within that pattern, men could generate successful lives. They could know when to plant, when to harvest, when to celebrate, when to feast, when to plow. This was their life. They were a part of the world in which they lived. And it was governed by the sun and the moon. Um, this is a very special and powerful thing that Odin understands this because all men should at some point understand that important relation and all of the dynamics of the energies exchanged between these three, three bodies of mass in the universe in this solar system. Bafruth near spake, speak forth now, Gangenrath, if there from the floor thou wouldst thy wisdom make known. What name has the river that twixt the realms of the gods and the giant goes? Odin spake, giving is the river that twixt the realms of the gods and giant goes. For all time ever open it flows, no ice on the river there is. So that's an important thing we need to pay attention to as well. That river that flows between the realm of the giants and gods, it's never iced over. And yet the realm of the giants is usually considered to be a cold realm. But this river is never frozen. They'll never walk across it. Speak forth, Gang and Wrath, if they're from the floor. Hiram uh, Fraxi means frosty mane. And ifing, there is no other reference to this river, which never freezes, so the giants cannot cross it. That's the footnote there. Bathuth near spake, speak forth now, Gag and Wrath, if they're from the floor, thou wouldst thy wisdom make known. What name has the field wherein fight shall meet Surt and the gracious gods? 
Odin spake, Vigorith is the field wherein fight shall meet Surt and the gracious gods. A hundred miles each way does it measure, and so are its boundaries set. Vafufnir spake. So in those questions, he understands the boundaries of what is considered divine and what is considered a kind of a base idea that separates Vafufnir from the gods. He understands the movements of time of the sun and the moon that governs all life and the flows of water on this planet. And he has this understanding of how it's all going to kind of end because fire is going to burn it all down and where it's going to happen. So these simple things that cover the basic idea of a man's life. He knows the sun's going to rise. He knows the moon's going to rise. And he knows there's a boundary to where he can go, where he can achieve, or what, he, what his imagination might come up with. There's a boundary between the divine and the, and the very simple. Um, how do we cross that? How do we come out of that base, simple thought process driven primarily by ego and into something that might be of a higher mindset? And where is the place where everyone's going to, where we're going to lose it all, where fire burns it all down, no matter what success we might have achieved? Vafufnir spake, wise art thou guest, to my bench shalt thou go. In our seats, let us speak together. Here in the hall, our heads, O oh guest, shall we wager our wisdom upon? So in the simple questions, he got him, well, this guy might know a little bit of stuff. Let's sit down and talk, but I'm still going to take your head if you lose. So it's a serious thing with this guy. If he loses this, he loses more than his head. His, his ego will have been destroyed. That image of who he thinks he is is very much a threat in all of this. Oh, then spake, first answer me well if thy wisdom avails, and thou knowest it, Vafruthnir, now in earliest time, whence came the earth or the sky, thou giant sage? So, in the footnotes, in Sert is the ruler of the firewood, fire world, Muspelheim, who comes to attack the gods at the last battle. Vigrith is literally the field of battle. Snorri quotes this stanza, stands at a hundred miles, a general phrase for a vast distance. Um, fragmentary version of this poem, uh, poem in the uh, Arnagamnion Codex begins in the middle of the first line of this stanza. So there's a little break here where they had to put the two together. Vafuthnir spake, out of Ymir's flesh was fashioned the earth, and the mountains were made of his bones, the sky from the frost-cold giant's skull, and the ocean out of his blood. When we look at that line, the ocean out of his blood, if you look at the prevalence of water in every living thing, you begin to look at water in the earth's crust, in the ocean, in every living thing, in the trees, how it moves, how it reacts, how it uh, freezes, how it thaws. Um, it begins to almost take on the appearance that water is the most successful expression of life. And not only that, it is this powerful conduit for spiritual energy that spiritual well-being that we receive at the naming of a baby. For the church, it's a baptism. For the Hindus, it is bathing in the Ganges. This water that controls literally all life on earth is one of the most potent expressions of life. For a mammal to return into the ocean, such as the whale, and adapt itself so successfully that it becomes the largest living creature in the world, we begin to understand that this blood of Ymir is a far more powerful substance than we might understand. Oh, then spake, next answer me well, if thy wisdom avails, and thou knowest it, Vafruthnir. Now, whence came the moon over the world of men, that fares, and the flaming sun? So now he's turning it back on him. He knows they come up every day, where they come from. Vafruthnir spake, Mundal fairy is he who begat the moon and fathered the flaming sun. To round of heaven each day they run to tell the time for men. Um, Mundafari means the turner. It's kind of in question marks. Known only as the father of Manny the moon and Sol or Suna the sun. Note that curiously enough, Manny is the boy and Sol the girl. According to Snorri, Sol drove the horses of the sun and Manny those of the moon for the gods. Indignant that they should have been given such imposing names, took them from their father to perform these tasks. Um, most of the solar deities, and indeed Baldur is a solar deity, Frey is kind of a solar deity, but in the rest of the 
mythology such as Apollo, um, the sun is usually a masculine image. I think in Japan, it is a, it is a female deity. Uh, this is an interesting, uh, interesting uh, development. It's something that I would encourage you, if you have the time or the interest, take a little bit further look into why the sun is a feminine deity and why the moon is the masculine deity. Um, the moon inspiring those passions of the werewolf and some of the other changes that occur during a full moon, the sun uh, blessing the world with light that, so that everything might grow. Um, Thor traveling to the east each day to fight trolls, um, perhaps so that the sun might come up again to pave the way for that, the, the warder of men paving the way for this blessing of light. Fafruth near spake, the father of day is Delling called, and the night was begotten by Nor. Full moon and old by the gods were fashioned to tell the time of men. So the father of day is Delling, and the night was begotten by Nor. And her daughter, her granddaughter, was Yord. Full moon and old by the gods were fashioned to tell the time for men. So the sun and the moon, once again, are set there to tell the night time for men. An important distinction for how we move across this through time and how we incorporate ourselves into the world we live in. We're not sitting here looking at our watch. We're, it's a call to action, if you will, to live life. Oh, then spake forth, answer me well, if wise thou art called, if thou knowest it, vow for Uthmir now, whence did winter come or the summer warm first with the gracious gods? Vathruth near spake, Vindisval he was who was winter's father, and Zavoseth summer begat. So in these notes in stanza 25, Delling, the day spring, probably another form of the name Dogling, meaning the son of the dew, is probably more correct, the husband of naught or night. Their son was Dag or day. Snorri calls the name of night Norvi or Narfi and puts him among the giants. Neither the Regis or the Arianum Codex indicates a lacuna. Most editors have filled out the stanza with two lines from late paper manuscripts, and both of these shall ever be till the gods to destruction go. Now, Boog ingeniously paraphrases Snorri's prose. Vindisval's father was Vosuth called, and rough is all his race. Vindisval means the wind cold, and called Vindilioni, the wind man, Zavothus, the gentle, the rough winter wind and the gentle southern wind. So there's interesting, interesting stuff there. Now, Odin, fifth, answer me well, if wise thou art called, if thou knowest about truth near now, what giant was fashioned of old and the eldest of Ymir's kin? Vathruth near spake, winter's unmeasured ere earth was made was the birth of Burgomir. Thruthgeldmir's son was the giant strong and Argomir's grandson of old. So there's this family tree right there. Mimir comes in that along the way too. Oh, then spake, six, answer me well, if wise thou art called, if thou knowest it, Vathruth near now. Whence did Arglumir come with the giant's kin, long since thou giant sage? Vathruth near spake, down from Elvigar did venom drop and wax till a giant it was. And thence arose our giants in race, and thus so fierce we are found. So let's get them names because they're important. Emir's kin, the giants. Burgomir, when the gods slew Emir in order to make the world out of his body, so much blood flowed out from him that all the frost giants were drowned except Burgomir and his wife who escaped in a boat. That touches point on what the Voluspa says. She remembers a world before, at the beginning of the Voluspa. She remembers a time before. So there is a hint at the very cyclical nature of everything we believe in. It's going to grow, it's going to flower, it's going to decay, it's going to re rot, it's going to be reborn. So there's a real powerful hint. These frost giants existed when they slew Ymir. And all of them were drowned except Burgomir and his wife who escaped in a boat. There is a part of a flood myth right there. A flood myth that has happened who knows how many times in this world with the changing of glaciers melting and flash floods across the world. We have great canyons that were washed out in an instant in Iceland and the Oregon Scablands were washed out in a, in a matter of a week 
from the melting of the Laurentide ice sheet. Uh, there's places like that all over the planet. Those great floods are a part of something grander than the seasonal flooding of your regular river upon which people settled. These were those dramatic events that changed the course of the evolution of mankind. Now, through, through Gilmir, the mightily burning, we know nothing, but Argomir was the frost giant's name for Ymir himself. Thus, Ymir was the first of the giants, and so Odin's question is answered. Odin spake, seventh, answer me well, if wise thou art called, if thou knowest, if thou truth near now. How begat he children, the giant grim, who never a giantess knew? Vafruthner spake, they say neath the arms of the giant of ice grew man, child, and maid together. And foot with foot did the wise one fashion a son that six heads bore. You know, it's not very often that you come across a multi-headed um, entity in the northern lore, but there's one right there. The only other one that I know of is the 900 grand mam of uh, Tyr. His grandmother, when he went home to get the mild white cauldron to brew the mead at Eager's Feast, his grandmother had 900 heads and greatly he loathed her. Well, I would too if, you know, you've got grandma with 899 heads cooking biscuits and as soon as you walk in the door, one full flies around to give you the full face. I wouldn't much care for that either. But be that as it may, Odin spake, eighth answer me well, if wise thou art called, if thou knowest it, thou truth near now. What farthest back dost thou bear in mind, for wise thy wisdom, giant? So there's a footnote here for that 33, the, the head. Um, Snorri gives, without materially elaborating on it, the same account of how Ymir's son and daughter were born under his left arm, and how his feet together created the son. That this offspring should have had six heads is nothing out of the ordinary but for various giants had more than the normal number. And Ymir's mother is credited with a little matter of 900 head. Now that's Tyr's grandmother. Um, of the career of Ymir's six-headed son, we know nothing. He may have been the Thruthgill Mir of stanza 29. Well, Thruthnir spake 35, winters unmeasured ere earth was made was the birth of Burgomir. The first, this first knew I well when the giant wise in a bolt of old was born. There's the old boat story. Odin spake, ninth, answer me well, if wise thou art called, if thou knowest it, Valthruth near now. Whence comes the winds that fares over the waves, yet never itself is seen? And Valthruth near spake, in an eagle's guise at the end of heaven, Gresselveg sits, they say, and from his wings does the wind come forth to move over the world of men. Now, Hresvelg means the corpse eater. And that's, that's the movement of, um, it's really probably the predecessor to the Valkyries. That's the, the corpse eater that, that, that eats all the other corpses and it's constantly flying around eating all the dead stuff. Terrifying monster in its own respect, but that's the wind that moves over the world, the movement of the flow of energy across the surface of the earth. This is an early explanation of that that I expound upon in uh, Blind of One Eye. Odin spake, tenth, tenth, answer me now if thou knowest all the fate that is fixed for the gods. Which came up New York to the kin of the gods, rich in temples and shrines he rules, though of gods he was never begot. Now, this is, uh, this question, the question formula changes. And Odin's questions from this point on concern more or less directly the great final struggle. Lion four is presumably spurious. New Earth on New Earth and the Wains, who gave him up as a hostage to the ends to the gods at the end of their war. Um, Balthuthnir spake in the home of the Vanir, the Wains, did the wise ones create him and gave him his pledge to the gods. At the fall of the world shall he fare once more home to the Wains so wise. So. It's kind of an interesting thing that the abundance, the, the one God that controls fire and ice, the two elements that existed alongside the great yawning void of Ganunengat, the is controller of that. He is, he can still the fires, he can still the seas. Uh, if you look at the prose Edda and his description, this is a very powerful being and his children literally are the abundance for men and women across the world. They are Freya and Freya, these gods of abundance and spring rains. Um, 
the example of how to become a good husband when he marries Gerda and sets aside the ways of the warrior. And Freya, when she loses her husband, yet still she raises them with such with such love and caring that they become literally treasures to the world as the grandchildren of Newer should be a real treasure to the world. The grandchildren of all of the couples in the Riggs Thula are a great benefit to the society in which they live. It should be no different in the, in the home of the gods. Um, so when the Vanir pledge this literal God of abundance to, the, to Asgard, Odin really creates a very strong and powerful community there of divine beings that govern abundance, love, strength, sacrifice, uh, wisdom, all of those things that a community should have to be successful. And we need to pay attention to the, what he's developed, who he's gathered around him so that he might enjoy a successful um, community in Asgard, despite the bewitching of men's minds by the love of gold and the theft of teamwork. Now, uh, Odin spake 40. Now, this one's kind of missing in the manuscripts. 11th, answer me well. What men blank in, blank home each day to fight go forth? Now, if we look at that, there are some translations it should probably run something like this. 11th, answer me well, if thou knowest all, the fate that is fixed for the gods. What men are they who in Othan's home each day to fight go forth? Well, that's the heroes, those who are brought to Valhalla and Vingolf by the Valkyries. After the days fighting, they are healed of their wounds and all feast together. Valthruth near spake, the heroes all in Othan's hall each day to fight go forth. They fell each other and fare from the fight, all healed, full soon to sit. Othan spake, Twelfth, answer me now how all thou knowest of the fate that is fixed for the gods, of the runes of the gods in the giant's race. The truth indeed dost thou tell, and wide is thy wisdom, giant. So Odin's giving him a little bit of credit. Yeah, you, you know some things, but do you know how to implement them? And that's the root of all of this. We might know all kinds of things, but it's like my buddy told me, I can give you a great big hammer, but if you can't use it to build something fantastic, you're just carrying around a hammer. Of the runes of the gods and the giant's race, the truth indeed can I tell. For to every world have I won. To nine worlds came I, to Niffel beneath, to home where dead men dwell. Okay. Oh, then spake, much have I fared, much have I found, and much have I got from the gods. This is what he said to Frigg at the beginning. What shall live of mankind when at last there comes the mighty winter to men? In Hod Mimir's wood, now that's a name for Mimir, shall hide themselves, leaf and leaf are seer then. Leaf and leaf are seer mean life and the love of life, the expression of water. It's no accident they're in the wood by Mimir's well. That expression of life most successfully created by um, water and sunshine and life and love of life. The nine worlds of Nephili means the dark hill. Story quotes this stanza, Hodimir's wood, probably this is the ash tree Yggdrasil itself, which is sometimes referred to as Mimir's tree because Mimir waters from it from his well. And note in Zvipdagmal 30, Hodimir is presumably another name for Mimir. Leaf, life, and leafasir, sturdy of life or love of life. Nothing further is known of this pair from whom the new race of men is to spring. Um, most likely it is not someone of our caliber. Most likely it is some of the original energy of life and the love of life stored in that tree of Yggdrasil um, because they have what it takes. We could, in this day and age, if we were thrust back into our great great grandfather's time, we would have some time to adjust. But our great great grandfathers were perfectly suited to living and developing and building and enjoying success, else we wouldn't be here. They survived, and not only that, they thrived. If you're going to bring that life and love of life or sturdy of life back into a world that's been destroyed, you're going to need some individuals that know how to survive. And that's who they are. In Hodemus, which will hide themselves, leaf and leaf is here then. The morning dews for meat shall they have, such food shall men then find. So they're going to know where to find the food. They're going to understand that morning dew falls from the moon, from the, from the 
from the froth of him faxi. The morning dews for meat shall they have, and such food shall men then find. This is also the same uh, chalk white or bone white or white colored water that the norns water the tree of Yggdrasil with. The dews from the dale then fall, and each morning the norns water refresh the roots of the tree of Yggdrasil. Now men will begin to live in that same manner. They will be a part of the world in which they live. This is kind of an image that we should be cultivating in our lives. That every day we are refreshed with this knowledge that we have and we cultivate an image of what we want to become. Uh, strong, beautiful, caring, compassionate, capable of defending our home, of putting food on the table, of all of these things. And some people want to digress from that and say, well, that's, we need to be more traditional. I don't want to do that. Listen, this is the world we live in. This faith has brought us here, and we should not deny ourselves the permission to be as successful as we can possibly be. Odin spake, much have I fared and much have I found. Much have I got from the gods. Whence comes the sun to the smooth sky back when Fenrir has snatched it forth? Bathruth near spake, a daughter bright, Alfrotho bears, here Fenrir snatches her forth. Her mother's paths shall the maiden tread when the gods to death have done. So after the gods have been destroyed at the end of the world, Suna's daughter takes up the reins of racing the sun around the world. And she travels her mother's path when the gods to death have gone. She follows the pattern of her mother. And once again, she becomes a great benefit to the world. She becomes that light in the darkness, Kenaz, that torch that each of our ancestors carry. Um, there's an important thing to, do, to understand there that it, it does begin anew. And it's the daughter that takes care of it. Oh, then spake, much have I fared, much have I found, much have I got from the gods. What maidens are they so wise of mind that forth over the sea shall fare? So that question about in 47, here Fenrir snatches her forth. That's probably a confusion between uh, Fenrir and the wolf Skull. Skull is the one who steals the sun. Um, and the sand, and the elf with her, all the elf beam is the sun. So she's she goes by the elf beam now. Bafufner spake, over Mugler the seer's hill shall the maidens pass, and three are their throngs that come. They all shall protect the dwellers on earth, though they come from the giant's kin. All of the deities in Asgard are the giant's kin. Yet each one of them have endured some kind of trial or some kind of suffering or some kind of change in their thought process to allow them to become and accept the roles and responsibilities that are thrust upon them by their wish to develop, to become something more. They do not shirk that challenge and they become something worthy of emulation. So now we're talking about three throngs that come. They come the, to protect the dwellers on earth. Now, Mogadishir are the desiring sons. They're not mentioned elsewhere in the other poems. Uh, the maidens, apparently the Norns, like the giant maids. These Norns, however, are kindly to men. So something very powerful changes when we burn it all down and get rid of that love of gold and the bewitching of men's mind and the inability to work together. The desiring sons come out and they shall they shall be the protect they shall protect the dwellers of earth. This has always been Thor's role as the warder of men. His sons also survive, so perhaps the two uh, overlap, the desiring sons perhaps being a kinning for Magni and Modai. Um, in the giant's home, Vither and Valley shall dwell. Oh, let's see, I missed a point here. Much have I fared, much have I found, much have I God of the gods. Who then shall rule the realm of the gods when the fires of Surt have sunk? Valfruth near spake, in the gods home Vithar and Valley shall dwell. These are Odin's sons. When the fires of Surt have sunk, Mathi and Magni shall Mjolnir have when Vingnir falls in fight. So Vithar is the son of Odin who slays the wolf Fenrir, and Valley the son of Odin begot to avenge Baldur's death. So 
as when old when Balder was killed, he had a son with Render, and they had Valley, and Valley avenged the death of Balder. Um, Vithar is the son of Odin who slays the wolf Fenrir. So every time they trim up their shoes, they would save a scrap of leather because he collected that leather to have a sturdy shoe to rip that jaw's wolf's neck, his uh, that wolf's jaws in half. Get it right, and I might sound intelligent. Um, Modi is wrath and Magni is might, the sons of the god Thor, who after his death inherited his famous hammer, Mjolnir. Concerning this hammer, especially the Thrymsviska Passim Vingnar, the hurler, Thor, concerning his death, Velusa, uh, stanza 56. This stanza is quoted by, by Snorri. Stanza 52. Much have I fared, much have I found, much have I got of the gods. What shall bring the doom of death to Odin when the gods to destruction go? Valfuthnir spake, the wolf shall fail the father of men, and this shall Vithar avenge. The terrible jaw shall he tear apart, and so the wolf shall he slay. Odin spake, much have I fared, much have I found, much have I got from the gods. What spake Odin himself in the ears of his son, ere in the bale fire he burned? Now, is that really a trick question? Or is there really something we need to be figuring out from this movement of time? When Odin sacrificed himself to himself on his tree of Yggdrasil, he pierced himself with his own sword in the side. He hung there for nine days and nights with no, no one there to assist him. But there was someone there because he caught a glimpse of his ancestors. Each ancestor carries a torch. He heard the songs of his ancestors. And then he fell. How did he fall? Somebody cut him down. He picked up the runes. He picked up the great keys to the universe. He shed him. He burned away through pain and suffering those weaker aspects of himself which cost him the throne of Asgard. He had to go wandering to find that. Who knows if nine days and nights means nine months, nine hundred years, a time frame. How long is this journey of Baldur's going to take? Nine days, nine months, 900 years? Who's going to be his guide in that? Why, it's obviously going to be hell herself. Because as soon as he gets there, she gives him the high seat. He's got a journey to undertake too. He's got some things of himself he's got to burn away. What wisdom might that look like? Is that not an integral part of all that we've discussed? This understanding of the flows of energy across the surface of the world? how we incorporate ourselves into the world, the heritage we leave by creating strong sons and daughters that they might carry on, what it might look like. What would Odin whisper into Baldur's ear? How to make it through that journey? A man that's only concerned with the possession of that knowledge will never think to look for that answer. He will possess that knowledge to be important just like the giants that possess the meat of inspiration. They don't drink it. They've read the words, but they lack the understanding of the mentor. They think they know a great many things, but they haven't understood how to implement them in their lives. And this is why that question is asked. No man can tell what in olden times thou spakest in the ears of thy son. With faded mouth, the fall of the gods, and mine own and olden tales have I told. With Odin in knowledge, now have I striven, and ever the wiser thou art. He admits defeat, he probably loses his head. Now, in stanza 54, Bo Boogie changes lines three and four to run. What did Odin speak in the ear of Balder? Went to the bale fire they bore him. For Baldur's death in Veluzba, 3a, and note, the question is, of course, unanswerable, say by Odin himself, and so the giant at last recognizes his guest. Balthuthnir was rash enough to wager his head against his guest in the outcome of the contest of the wisdom, so he knows that his defeat means death. It is a death of the image he has created himself. He literally loses his head. And it happens to a lot of us. Is it something that stops us? Is it something that stops it? Is the fear of that loss of our ego so great that we buckle down and contend with 
sources of inspiration that are much greater than ourselves, never daring to ponder if the information we need to answer that question of what might I tell my son on his great journey might really be contained in this lore. So there's, uh, there's a lot to think about in all this. And it's of such importance that it's repeated, this style of uh, question and answer is repeated four times in, in the Poetic Edda. Once by Thor, to, once by Thor concerning the marriage of his daughter to an individual who is entirely unworthy to marry his daughter. And he keeps him battered there until the sun comes up and proves how unworthy he is. It's the same thing here. So when we look at the knowledge contained in this lore, we need to be looking at it with the idea that this kind of information provided purpose, guidance, and direction for literally millions of people for thousands of years. There's no need to create some new ideology or traditional values or reinvent the wheel to appear more than because that's all that's happened. We simply look at this, we begin to understand our place in the world, we tell the time, we understand how the flows of energy work, and most important of all, somewhere along the way, we begin to understand the language of the birds. It seems that that also is a, is a inclination of the great understanding that might, we might be able to achieve once we begin to understand the runes themselves. That message that the gods have helped move through time, that governs the course of a man's life. Freedom and order and see if they don't measure up. I wrote about it in, uh, in life in life and the love of life. That is all that I have for tonight. I appreciate immensely everyone being patient and taking the time to listen to me talk. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, thank you guys for joining. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer a couple of them. Um, if not, I will uh, slide on in here and grab some dinner.